And we're talking about different secondary structures. And so, first of all, let's just do a quick review. All right, so I just wanted to do a quick review. Um, remember, we're talking about the hierarchy of protein structure. And I'm going to abbreviate structure this way. <clears throat> And we've covered two of them so far. So, so far there's the primary structure and the secondary structure. There's also tertiary, which we'll cover hopefully later today, and maybe quaternary. Every protein, this is important, every protein has up through tertiary structure. Not every protein complex will have well, not every protein will have a quaternary structure. That's important. That's usually one of those kind of questions that can sometimes be asked and people will either overthink or will forget about. Every structure, I mean, every protein has at least primary, secondary, and tertiary, but not everything has a quaternary. And I'll explain what makes quaternary different than the others in, later today or, or on Friday. Okay, so remember, what is the primary structure of a protein? That's just the amino acid sequence. That's at this, the simplest level, and it always goes from the N terminus to the C terminus. Okay, that's not an asparagine there, that's the N terminus. <clears throat> There's a directionality, just like we always talk about DNA. What's the directionality? Do you remember for DNA and RNA? Five prime to three prime. Well, for proteins, we always talk about the amino terminus or the N-terminus to the C-terminus or the carboxy terminus. Then we have the secondary structure. And what was the secondary structure? That's the localized structure. And what was it due solely to? That's right, due to the backbone interactions. It does not have to do with the R group. It's supposed to be backbone. And so examples where, where we left off, we were talking about alpha helices. We have a beta sheet. There are, there's, there's one called the 310 helix, which is less common. You could have, um, there are certain, there are loops, and the list goes on. There are some that are less common. The two main ones are alpha helices and beta sheets, and those are connected by loops and, or loop regions and things like that. And then we'll talk about the tertiary structure, and like I said later, to cover it. But right now we're doing primary and secondary. No, where how do I go back? Clear all. Okay, so <clears throat> the picture that we had, and I just want to show it. So the alpha helix, whenever the helix, if this is the backbone, the R groups always point out and away. Okay. This would, I'm showing them all being alanine, but they could be you know, glycine. They can be other things, too. We talk about things that can disrupt that alpha helix. Now, if you take this alpha helix here and you turn it on its side where you're looking down it, it really does look, you have like a centerpiece. And there are the pictures that I gave to you on your PowerPoint is demonstrates this much better. And then you would see things that coming off of it, kind of like the little hurricane symbol in some ways. But there's always that hole. And we also talked about how there's a handedness to it in an overall dipole moment. Okay. And how proline can break it, or not, we call it, uh, can distort it to cause it to be kinky. Or you can have things that are the same charge right by each other, like two or three lysines together, which are all positively charged, that will cause an electrostatic repulsion. Or you can have things that are just really big and bulky because then they sterically hinder, and that causes the alpha helix to be bent. So that's why not every alpha helix is perfectly straight. That's the important thing. All right, 
So then we have the beta sheets. <clears throat> so, if you remember the alpha helix, the, the way that the backbone interacted with itself was the interactions was where you have a hydrogen bond donor from below with a hydrogen bond donor of, up above it or vice versa. And so they were all pointing up and down, up and down, up and down as you went along that coil. Well, here, this is different. So the hydrogen bonds are perpendicular to the direction of the polypeptide chain. And so what I wanted to show here is if we look here in this beta sheet, this is the amino terminus, the N terminus. And we can see it goes like here. It would loop or something at some point in time, and then it goes, whoops. And another piece of it comes right here. <clears throat> and when they say that they are perpendicular to the direction of the polypeptide chain, what they're meaning is like one strand. Remember I talked to you about how strands make up like a sheet? Just like in fabric, one strand, the hydrogen bond, the hydrogen bond donor. Or this is technically this right here is an acceptor. It interacts with the next strand over. So that's what they mean by they're perpendicular or orthogonal to it. And so that's when you have another hydrogen here that's interacting with the hydrogen bond acceptor on the other side, so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay. So. The R groups for it alternate. One R group on one amino acid is going to stick above the plane. We can see that over here. Where the very next amino acid, the R group is below the plane. Then it's above, then it's below, above, and below. And because of the way the rigidity of the peptide backbone, the amide plane, remember, it causes it to be pleated. That's why sometimes they're called beta pleated sheets. So it causes it to look like corrugated you know, metal or something. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And there are two types of strand interactions. So there, there's the kind that's called parallel, which is what here is here at the top. And then there's anti-parallel. What it literally means is if you look, it goes from the N to the C direction. If they're going the same direction, see how this one's N to C, N to C? Those are parallel with respect to each other. Or you could have it to where one strand is going N to C while the next one's going the opposite direction. And so it's called anti-parallel. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you in a moment how you can actually take that. And you can have the same beta sheet and have different strands going different directions. So you may have a couple of them that are parallel and then one of them is anti-parallel. <clears throat> so let me just... Now on here, on this one that's parallel, if you notice, see the hydrogen bond formation is kind of zigzagged. However, if it's anti-parallel, they're straight up and down. That's how you can actually clearly tell one from the other without having to sit there and go from amino acid to amino acid to amino acid. You still can do it that way. It just takes longer. But just look at the hydrogen bond doning, uh, the hydrogen bond pattern, I should say. If you see it where you see it straight up and down, if you notice two of them are closer together, then it's a space and two of them are closer together, then that means that it's anti-parallel. If they're kind of zigzagged, then that means that those two strands are parallel with respect to each other. And a lot of times, whenever they do like the cartoon kind of way of doing protein structures, which you've seen, you know, they'll do coils for the amino uh, for the alpha helix, helix, and then they do these arrows. And that arrow shows you the directionality. So that would be a beta strand next door or adjacent to an alpha helix. And then this portion right down here would be the loop. Well, not this, pair. this is a single strand, but it does indicate direction. So it goes from the N terminus to the C terminus. Okay, it goes into C, or direction, I should say. So here I can actually do, oh, 
See, I knew that there was a way to erase. And here, the X, X. So sometimes you'll see the protein secondary, once again, we're talking about secondary structure here, written out something like this. So for example, we have the N terminus is a disordered, and all of a sudden we have an alpha helix, a loop, maybe we have a beta strand, there's a big loop, whoops, here, let me reset a little bit, so I went a little too far. <clears throat> little loop big loop and then this was the C terminus for example this is one example and I deliberately did this because now we can see we have one alpha helix and this is an alpha helix by itself But we have a beta sheet. So this entire thing here is a beta sheet. And many times they will even give, they'll either give the helix or the beta sheet a number based off of the order. So maybe they call this one A because when we started in the primary sequence, it's the first one that you come across. Whereas this one would be B, because it's the second one, because as you, as you follow along, then this one would be C, and then this one is D. Or you could say 1, and B would be 2, C would be 3, and D would be 4. It doesn't matter. Some, some places they put letters, some places they put numbers. <clears throat> but if you notice, if we compare A, D, and C, they are all parallel with respect to each other. But B is anti-parallel with respect to C. So, for example, if we did in the hydrogen bond, don donors would look something like bonding would look like this, right? They're going to be zigzagged. But right here, it would look like that. So they don't just because this is one of the ways, one of the things I wanted to point out about primary structure versus secondary structure. Just because amino acids may be next to each other in the primary structure doesn't mean that they're going to be right next to each other in the secondary structure. See, because so for example, I'll change my color here. Even though A, the amino acids of A are right next to the amino acids of B in the primary structure, in the secondary structure they're further apart because Ds are actually closer in three-dimensional space than A. But once again, we're talking about only interactions from the uh, backbone. So there are other examples as well. This is one. Unfortunately, this program won't let me hit like each point and to go through each point at a time. So this is just an example of the collagen triple helix. So instead of collagen, okay. So collagen, which first of all, where is, what, what, what part of your body has collagen? Where is one of the main, main part of your body that has collagen? Bones. Pardon? Your bones. It's not your bones. Hair. Hair may have some, but it's your skin. Like, you know, you hear about people getting like collagen, in, you know, injections and things like that. Okay. And so it's your skin. Now, collagen, it's why gives the, makes your skin have that, um, makes it rugged, but it has it where you can push it and it bounces back, you know, it gives it elasticity, but it also gives it strength. And the proteins, and we mentioned this last chapter, the chapter back when we were going over the different types of amino acids, the protein that, or the, the structure of collagen, their helices are really, really tiny and skinny. So there are lots and lots of glycines. Remember, glycine just has a hydrogen, so it can make really sharp turns. So it's not really an alpha helix. Like sometimes it's called the collagen. But it's three helices of collagen all come together. It's like a rope. So that's why it gives it extra strength. Because you have like three different strands that are intertwined together. Okay, so that's why it forms like a big rope. 
Um, and that rope overall is called triple collagen. One third of all of the amino acids in each chain are proline and hydroxyproline. Okay, which remember, we already know what proline looks like. And the hydroxyproline Picture, but it's not the best picture. Hydroxyproline is one where an alcohol has been added to one of the carbons that's of that ring chain. And they can also have a specialized modified lysine where the lysine also gets an alcohol added to it as well. Okay? So it's helical, but it's not an alpha helix. Alpha helix has a very set, remember it's got set um, degrees for its, the phi and psi angles. I, don't, I didn't make you guys memorize all this, I had to. Where you had to know uh, for every turn it's 3.7, you know, amino, 3.6, 3.7 amino acids per turn, and you had to know the pitch of how many angstroms it is between one coil to the next coil. Well, collagen has a very, very, this is a very skinny looking. Okay, you'll see see in just a moment. But because of the alcohol groups between the proline, so you know the proline, this is the backbone. Proline kind of looks like this, but since there's an alcohol here. And on the one of the other strands would have an alcohol on it. They can have hydrogen bonding between the prolines, and that helps that rope be even stronger. So not only is it coiled, but it's like it's interwoven within respect to each other. <clears throat> However, as you get older, that's when there are certain things that can happen. One thing, just like you know, from being either from environmental toxins, from UV light, things like that, is you can have them form cross links. Okay, and so that's where you get a covalent bond between lysine and any histidines there. What that does is now, that's one of the reasons why your skin starts to break down and you lose that elasticity. Because since it's no longer like a nice little slinky kind of thing, you know, uh, uh, spring, but they're stuck together. So it's more rigid and it, it loses its plasticity. Things start to go wrong. And then there's also a disease where there are certain people that they lack enough hydroxyproline. See, hydroxyproline also has a three-letter code. And they lack hydroxyproline because they have enzyme deficiency for it. And so because of that, they get fragile collagen disease. And so they kind of, their skin, since they don't have um, enough hydrogen bonds between their collagen, their skin can even slip. And so uh, they have a lot of skin disorders, and so like their skin is not supple like it would be for a normal person. Okay. And so one of my colleagues that I went to grad school with, she went on to go on to work at the patent office, and the man that she had her first year there at the US patent office, you have to share a little cubicle, little office area, and the man that she shared that, he actually had like the slippery skin disease. And so he had a relatively mild case of it, but yeah, his skin, even though he was young, his skin could sag, he didn't have the elasticity for it, it could, you can tear it, things like that. Okay. So this is what structure, uh, this is the, what collagen looks like. And so in the, there are three different colored uh, collagen helices here. So we have the one in this light color, one in the slightly darker color, and then the gray. <clears throat> Okay. And you can see, this is a glycine because it's a hydrogen, so you can't really see hydrogen whenever they do bonding. I mean, whenever they look at like crystal structures and stuff, hydrogen you know, is just that proton there within a single electron, so it doesn't really scatter like, electron density. And then we can see, here's a hydroxyproline. See, there's the alcohol group that's hanging off of the normal proline. This is a regular proline, alanine, which is also really tiny. And then we have another hydroxyproline. Proline. So because of that, Remember, proline makes it kinky, so it makes it really, really narrow. So it really does, instead of an alpha helix, which would look like this, it looks like this. <clears throat> and you can imagine hydrogen bonding occurring between some of the different alcohol groups between strand to strand. Okay, so we went over primary and we went over secondary. Now we're going to get to tertiary and quaternary. Okay. So if we think about it, once again, primary, because this is going to show up on quizzes or exams. Primary structure was just the amino acid sequence from the amino terminus or the N-terminus to the C-terminus. 
Then we have the secondary structure, and that is localized structure, and it is only due to backbone interactions. So now we can see where the tertiary structure builds upon that. Okay? And so now we're talking about three-dimensional space, and it does include the interactions between the R groups of the, the different um, um, R groups between the different amino acids. Okay? It can still also involve the backbone, because you may have an amino acid that's interacting with a hydrogen bond to a, something that's on a backbone. <clears throat> the way that I like to think of it is I call it the global structure. Because now we're talking about three-dimensional three space. So as I mentioned, every protein has a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary structure. Every protein has a group of amino acids that go from the N-terminus to C-terminus. Every protein will have some type of you know, degree of ordering, whether it's an alpha helix, a beta sheet, some loops, or something like that. And all of them will come together in a three-dimensional structure. Now, sometimes if the protein is really, really tiny, it's kind of hard to tell secondary versus tertiary because you may only have a couple of alpha helices and a beta sheet. You know? So that, then it's really like that one that I drew as an example. The difference between secondary and tertiary structure is really limited. But a lot of proteins are huge. Okay? And so then we're talking about there are parts of the primary sequence that even though they're close together in the primary sequence, they are very, very far apart from each other in the tertiary structure. You may have an alpha helix on one side, and near the amino terminus, it's interacting with the alpha helix all the way from the C terminus, which is interacting with the beta sheet from the middle, and it gets really complicated. And we'll see lots of, part of your protein paper, you know, uh, your enzyme paper, specifically if you look at the instructions, it asks you to talk about the different types of structures that are involved. And we're gonna look at more of the, these later on. So we're talking about the global arrangement in three-dimensional space. Okay. The quaternary structure is, this one is, for whatever reason, is the one that tends to give people more difficulty. You only have a quaternary structure under certain conditions. Okay? You, first of all, you can only have a quaternary structure if you have multiple proteins coming together. interacting with each other. This is where it gets kind of confusing because they like to use the term polypeptide. And so if you have multiple polypeptides, which is the same, multiple proteins, like protein A and protein B. So if you think back to the ribosome from biology, especially the bacteria ribosome, they talk about the 30S subunit and the 50S subunit, and it comes together to make the 70S subunit. Um, with the 30 and the 50 coming together to make the 70, that's a quaternary interaction. Okay, and when you have different, we actually it's a little bit more complex than that, but when you have multiple proteins coming together, hemoglobin, which has alpha subunits and beta subunits, which I always hate the fact that they call them alpha and beta because hemoglobin has no beta sheets. I don't know why they use the same letters. It's all alpha helical. Um, but there's actually two alphas and two betas that all come together in a quaternary interaction. It's a big, big complex. Okay. Or you can also use the term quaternary structure whenever we're talking about, for example, a protein and a nucleic acid and nucleic acids interacting with each other. You know, forming big complexes. This is the reason why not every protein will have a quaternary structure, because not every, oops, I don't know, I started to write every, complexes. <clears throat> not every protein comes and meets up with another protein to form something bigger. There are some that just do what they do. But you can imagine like the polymerase, what, what does DNA polymerase do? DNA polymerase. ACE is the ending for enzymes. And so it, most of them will actually make DNA, right? They add on because polymer, you're making more polymers of DNA. And so what happens though is it's got to bind to the template. And then whenever that DNA polymerase binds to the DNA for replication to occur, that's a quaternary interaction. You have DNA and, RNA, uh, DNA and proteins coming together to form a big complex. That can also be a quaternary interaction. Just like RNA 
RNAs and proteins come together to form the ribosome. That's a quaternary interaction. You have multiple things coming together to form a big complex. <clears throat> this, these are just other words saying it. Once again, tertiary structure is arrangement in three-dimensional space of all atoms. It's a global fold. Okay. So, well, they call it two subunits, but that's a misnomer because each of those subunits is another quaternary interaction. It's not a single protein, a 30S protein, a 50S protein. That 30S is actually proteins and RNAs all together in its own quaternary. Then the 50S is a bunch of RNAs and proteins that come together and they form an, an even larger one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So that's why some of these can, can get huge. Ribosome is, is a huge, huge complex. Okay. But they're not active until everything comes together. Okay. And then, I don't know why the old book used to lump this in. I don't like this. A lot of times, though, they just put two broad classes of proteins. They'll say, okay, there are fibrous proteins, and then there are glob glob globular proteins. So if we just talk about fibers, what does that sound like? Fibers. So if you're gonna describe a fiber, what would it look like? Thin, Thin long, straight, yes. Filamentous, you know, if you wanna think of a nice scientific sounding word. Whereas globular sounds, that's a glob. They typically, they're more spherical or round, and so. Okay. So collagen is one of the big examples, like we just talked about. Um, the collagen with respect to skin and how the, whenever it comes together and it forms really, really long strands, those are long fibers, okay? Or keratin of hair, things like that. So usually, they're usually almost always gonna be insoluble in water. Then we have the globular proteins. Many times, not always, but many times they're water soluble. You can actually have globular proteins that are really hydrophobic, but they're typically gonna be membranes, right? Because they're gonna be like baking pores and things like that, membranes. Okay. Almost always, oh, whoops. Yep. Almost always they're going to have the, their outsides will be hydrophilic and their insides will be hydrophobic, right? Because that's how they fold. They exclude water, they fold in on themselves, um, and then the outside's hydrophilic, assuming that they're soluble, water soluble protein. Now, if they're inside a membrane, it may look like something like this, and so I'm just going to draw a little. You, we'll discuss this kind of stuff later on so you don't have to draw it. But, you know, if this is the cell membrane, Then you may have this globular protein. That's not that's not to mean that it's an alpha helical. And so then it may be that this portion right here is actually hydrophobic because it's interacting with the hydrophobic tails of the membrane. But usually, if this is out in the cell, you're going to have a hydrophilic outside and a hydrophobic inside. And then some of the examples myoglobin and hemoglobin. And next chapter in particular, we, we pay a lot of attention when we talk about protein functions with myoglobin and hemoglobin. <clears throat> All right, so this is just some of the little pictures. You can see how it's, this is myoglobin structure. It's, om, it's all alpha helical. This is the heme. It's, it's, a, it's called a prosthetic group because it's added on afterwards, just like you know, a prosthesis. Um, and then this is just a filament. Okay. This is a space filling diagram of, of a globular protein. So here's collagen. We can see the collagen, how collagen all comes together since we're really, really strong and depending upon its, its connectivity, whether, because you can imagine the more cross links that it has, the less springy it will be. <clears throat> and then it once again, if you turn it in on its inside, then you do see this narrow hole. And if I remember right, that hole is 
almost exclusively glycine. There may be some alanines in there, but that's where all the glycine sides kind of point in, so that way they make those really sharp turns. Okay. So we talked about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Now we're going to talk about where it gets a little, the little gray. Like what happens when you've got pieces of secondary structure that come together frequently? Because many times, structure, remember, from even in organic chemistry, you always said it, structure determines function. So things that look a lot alike can usually have very similar functions. You know, that's why a recliner chair and that kind of chair, they're both chairs because they have very similar structures. Okay? And so there are these that they, a lot of times they call them motifs. Or a fold, like a certain, say, oh, that's a certain type of fold. Or once in a while they'll call it super secondary because it's kind of a bunch of second, you know, secondary structures, but it's not so big that it's a tertiary structure. I would never ask you to give an example. What's super secondary versus tertiary? That's when it gets kind of gray. But there are many times that they say, oh, this is a motif or it's a fold. Beta barrels is one that's very, very common. So if you notice, it's only consisting of beta sheets. But beta sheets are not perfectly flat. Since they're kinked, there's a slight, oh, what's it? It's a physics word I'm looking for. Not tilt. Well, that's what I'm going to say. Torque, like, to it. So they're kind of, to where if, you, if they're big enough, they will actually start to wrap around themselves. So beta barrels are usually really large proteins. And if you imagine it, it kind of reminds me of, what is that called? The Chinese handcuffs. You remember the Chinese handcuffs? You, know, you stick your fingers in the holes and you know, it kind of looks like, I me. Mean, that kind of looks like that. But you can then imagine that you take that, and I really wish I could you know, pick this up and like, <laughs> you could look down it. But you can usually look straight down it. So it forms a barrel, which is the reason why they call them beta barrels. Just like there's another called an alpha beta barrel, which is made of both alpha helices and beta, beta sheets. Okay, and so the beta barrels, many times they'll form things like pores. Because right, you can imagine, you have your membrane, you stick a barrel in it, and now it's got a way to go for things to go in and out. Now they may have, you know, lids and things like that to make it more complex than just being a pore. Or there are times that it's just a pore. Okay, but that's a beta barrel. That's called the beta-alpha beta loop because, if you notice, here's the N terminus and this is the C terminus. So it goes beta strand alpha helix beta strand. And so you see beta, alpha, beta loops a lot. And they can even be used as building blocks, so to speak, for larger structures. Like you have enough of these, you can actually form an alpha, beta barrel, which is what this is. So we have a bunch of little beta, alpha, beta loops, and they form their own little barrel. We've got a little hole here in the middle. <clears throat> Structures can be all alpha helical. I already mentioned myoglobin and hemoglobin are all alpha helical. This is serum albumin. Okay. These are their call numbers, like if you look up in the PDB, the protein database, which some of you may have already done that um, for other classes like genetics or something. You may have had to do some type of uh, bioinformatics kind of thing to we had to look at proteins and stuff. Or if you just go on PubMed, you can look up the PDB stuff, and then it'll give you the structure. That's just their identifier. It's almost like their social security number for their structure. And so <clears throat> that's serum albumin. Does anyone know what does serum albumin do? We're going to talk about it a lot next semester. It's very, very important. It's the protein that's usually the most abundant in your blood. I'll kind of give it that way. It's serum's in your blood. Yeah. Does albumin have to do with the image It It could. It could do that too. It's even more simple than that. It's the Uber of the blood, or the taxi cab service. I used to say taxi, but now I just gonna get hit with the time. It's Uber, and so it's almost like a sponge. Like it delivers medications, it can deliver lots of things, and so things bind to it, and it just goes from tissue to tissue and drops it off. It's like a transportation system. So that's why it makes sense that in your blood, it's usually that one in the highest concentrations. So, but yeah, a lot of your medications and stuff will adhere to it, and then it goes by this right receptor, and then it gets off, and things like that. I like that one. I have to call it the Uber one. Okay.
And so then there's lots of these. Uh, ferritin, that, that's a, what does Zewin, Zewin have any accuracy to what do you suppose a ferritin does? What does it sound like? Okay, but it's not a ferret. It has to do with iron and binds iron. You're going to learn, and this is something that you should start since you're already working on your enzymes. There are only so many classes of enzymes. If you can learn your classes of enzymes, it tells you so much. This one's pretty easy. Transferases, what do you suppose those enzymes do? <laughs> they transfer groups, and back at transfers, glycosyl, which is just a word for saying sugar. So, yeah, this one is a fold, or you see that transfers lots of sugars. <clears throat> so, there are certain things that are all beta, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> and then you can have things that are mixtures. Okay? In fact, this one, let me see, I think I got a blow up of it. No, I don't. This one right here, we'll talk about a little bit. You may even f hear about it a lot, depending upon what kind of enzymes you're working on. They, they sometimes refer to Rossman folds, because it's got a special name. And usually what that does is this is a player that's really important. That means it almost always will bind NAD or NADP, which is um, used for redox reactions in your body. Okay, Since we obviously think back to the, Organic chemistry, it's not like we can have manganese, you know, manganese oxide and stuff around that. Remember that, that was a baby crap lab. You know, because it did redox reactions, or you had to try to do hydrogen on the platinum. You know, you had to use hydrogen with platinum, palladium, nickel, or rhodium. Yeah, we don't have that in our body, so we use cofactors and enzymes to do that kind of stuff. And NAD, NAD, NADH, and NADP, NADPH are those that are used a lot of times. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead.